Yes, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. It is such a delight to be here today at DevOps Loop at VMworld. Um, I am going to spend some time today, the next 30 minutes or so, speaking to you about the business benefits of GitOps. Now, before I jump into that topic at hand, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been doing this for quite some time, uh, about 30 years in the industry. Um, I'm trained as a computer scientist, and you'll notice there that it says in the slides that I was a developer or was, wasn't ops. Um, and that's because up until about 10 years ago, I really was one of those developers that, and remember I said 30 years, so I was one of those old school developers that finished code complete, wiped my hands and said, we're going to go to the launch party and left everything else for the ops people to take care of. Well, about 10 years ago, not quite 10 years ago, I joined Pivotal as a part of the spinoff. And I learned in the first few weeks of working on the developer platform that was known as Cloud Foundry that, uh, that developer platforms were DevOps platforms. And I now consider myself as much of an ops person as I do a dev person. I've also spent the next, the, the, about the last 20 years, so about 10 years even before that, working on web architectures. Um, I've been doing cloud native for nearly a decade. It really started with that time at Cloud Foundry, um, even though we didn't call it cloud native back then. I already mentioned that time. And then for the last five, six years or so, I've been really focusing a lot on Kubernetes. Um, I also can't help but say that uh, I've spent so much time in the cloud native space that I did write a book. Uh, it's a book that is targeted at the application developer and architect that talks about the software design patterns that are necessary to make your software work well in the cloud. So enough about me, um, actually in just one little transition, I spent about the last 18 months or so really focusing on DevOps, which is not a replacement, uh, I'm sorry, of GitOps, which is not a replacement of DevOps. It's really just something, it's one of those practices and technologies that supports the DevOps agenda in a particularly good way. Now, don't worry if you don't know what GitOps is, I am going to talk about it in a moment, but let me set the stage first. This slide, what you see on the screen, is one of my favorite all-time talks and my favorite all-time slides. This screenshot was taken from the DevOps Enterprise Summit, which is the event that Gene Kim and uh, team put on. The person speaking there is a gentleman named Jonathan Smart. At the time, he was at Barclays Bank, and what he did with this slide was he built, he started in the, in the area where it says dev, because DevOps, of course, involves the dev. And he talked about the practices that we had been putting in place to gain efficiencies for the dev cycle of the dev, the dev part of the DevOps cycle or the dev part of the entire software development life cycle. And then he expanded it. And he expanded it to the left and said, now these are all the things that happen before we start dev planning, specs, some of which are still quite waterfall. And then on the right-hand side are the things that happen after we're code complete. So bringing things out to production, keeping things running well in production, doing cycling in production. And what he points out there is that we've done as an industry, we've made so many advances in the way that we do short cycles with the developers. We do either Scrum or other approaches to agile development. Woohoo! We're freaking agile in the dev part, but what about all the other elements? What we are going to talk about today is GitOps focused on the efficiencies that it brings to the right hand side of this picture. So how do we dovetail the development agility that we have with operational agility? So I promised to talk a little bit and introduce you to the concept of GitOps. And again, the emphasis here is that what GitOps does is it takes cloud native and it takes kind of DevOps all the way through to the operation side of that picture. So if we start with this as a high level overview of GitOps, we're going to start out with some runtime environment. That runtime environment is the target of the applications that we were just deving in that dev cycle that Jonathan Smart talked about. Now, 
That runtime environment doesn't need to be Kubernetes. It could be a different runtime environment. I'm going to talk about it from a Kubernetes standpoint here because it gives us something very concrete. It makes it a little less abstract. So I've got a runtime environment. And then on the left-hand side, I've got humans that are responsible for the deployment and the running of that application in production. So this is kind of the DevOps team on the left. Now, we just heard Kat talk about the fact that these are humans and they have bad days and they make errors. And that's really what GitOps is focused on, is to assist those humans in those tasks that they're doing. Now, she talked a lot about automation, and that's really, in a nutshell, where I'm headed, is the flavor of that automation. So how does then that application, that development team, the de DevOps team on the left-hand side, keep things, get things out into production and keep them running well there. Well, GitOps starts with Git. And it says, what we are going to do is we are going to store our code and configuration in Git, and we are going to use interfaces to that Git system, interfaces like GitHub or GitLab. We're going to use those as the interface for operations. What I mean by that is that we are not just storing our stuff in Git and then depending on those human operators to do the deployment in some manual way. We are, in fact, the human is interfacing into this overall system using the Git interfaces. And I'll talk more about this throughout the half hour. You'll also notice that there's an annotation there that says it's the desired state. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point a lot in the talk today, although we'll touch upon those elements. But part of the reason that I put Kubernetes on the far right-hand side is that Kubernetes is inherently a convergent system. And so what I'm storing in Git is an expression of the desired state where there's something that is constantly working to bring you in alignment with that desired state. So I'll say more about that in just literally a few seconds. So again, humans interface to operations is through Git. It's through Git commits. It's through um, uh, reviews, approvals, all of those things. Now, what happens when I do do a Git commit? Well, there's that automation that I was just talking about. So as Kat said, we aren't going to depend on the humans to take what we just changed and get it deployed to the right servers and the right order and those types of things. We're going to automate that. But I just hinted at there's something special about that automation. And this is critical to GitOps. GitOps is not saying, hey, we're going to do Git automation. We're part of the definition of GitOps is that it is a convergent automation. And again, that's why I used Kubernetes on the far right hand side, because it already natively supports this model of convergent automation and convergent constant convergence. So we've got convergent automation, and then I want to close the loop because the reality is that it's not only humans that are making the decisions on what things, gonna, what things are going to change in the production environment. Sometimes the automation itself or some other type of automated system is going to make a decision on behalf of the organization because they can make that decision better than humans. So, for example, if um, we are doing a deploy, a progressive deployment, and we start seeing problems, we want to revert back to the previous deployment immediately. And that's a decision that can be automated and made by that. But then we have a, a, a disconnect between what is running in, in the runtime system and what is in, stored in Git. So we want to be able to capture some of those automation-driven decisions back in the Git repository. And you'll see why as we go through the rest of the talk. OK, so that's what, what GitOps is. But really, I wouldn't be talk, providing you a whole lot of value in this talk if I just told you the mechanics and the kind of academic um, uh, definition of what GitOps is. So what is it? Why, why are we doing GitOps in the first place? What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to get better at doing software, technical term there, doing software. We're trying to get better at providing the right digital offerings 
with the right level of resiliency and the right level of constant updates to our end consumers. And we're just trying to get better at doing that. That's what the whole DevOps agenda is. Now, it's not lost on me that the very next person that you're going to hear from is the person who created this content that I'm going to reference here. I'm not going to spend time really going in detail over this content, but I'm leveraging this content. And this is a, this is a diagram taken out of the state of the DevOps report. I'm going to use it to say, this is a measure of how well we're doing software. And then I'm going to take certain GitOps practices and patterns, and I'm going to relate them to what we know to be good measures of doing software well. So for the rare person who in the audience who hasn't seen the State of the DevOps report and this particular bit of research, quick summary. What Nicole Forsgren, Jean, Jean Kim, and Jez Humble did in this work, and they also detailed in the book Accelerate, is they studied a whole bunch of data. They actually did data science. And what they did was they found correlations between IT practices, measurable IT practices, those are the four things down the left-hand side, and the level of performance of an organization. Now, you might say, well, what's what defines the level of performance of an organization? Well, it's the things that you would expect. It is high net promoter scores. It is gaining market share. It is profitability. So the ones that are the highest performers are, are, are measuring very strongly on all those things. And the lowest performers, of course, are measuring poorly on those. And there's these four attributes, which are deployment frequency. So the more frequently you deploy, the more likely you are to correlate with the elite performers or the high performers. The lower the lead time for change, that's the time from when I finished my code to the time that it is available for customers in production, lowering that time, again, you're a high performer. And then there's some kind of resilience characteristics, which is the time to restore a service. If that time is lower, then you're a higher, higher performer. That one, it makes intuitive sense for sure. And then change failure rate, oftentimes our failures come from changes. And if we can reduce the number of change, uh, failures that we have from changes, then we're going to have a more resilient system as well, and you'll correlate with that high performer. So what I want to do now is I want to take these practices, I want to take the GitOps practices and, um, and processes and, and technology and relate them to these four metrics on the left-hand side. I'm, and if you'll notice that there's color coding there, the green ones are the things that are a little bit more closely, not exclusively, but a little bit more closely related to the developer. And the things in blue are a little bit more closely related to the operational uh, um, stages. And so really that developer, what we wanna do is if we take a look at that, we wanna enable the developer to really be able to move very, very quickly. And it's really the DevOps team because they're responsible for operating their applications as well. We want them to be able to move quickly, but we also have to maintain a certain level of security, compliance, resilience, and so on. And I'm going to talk about both of these categories. But let me start first with the top two that are on this slide. So deployment frequency and lead time for change. How does GitOps support that? Well, let's look at it first from the developer perspective. The first thing that we're going to do is you notice that I said that Git is the interface for operations. Well, as the developer takes on responsibility for operations, the developer can leverage their skill set that they've already developed because they've become experts at Git, and they can leverage that same skill set and that same technology to be able to apply it to the operational characteristics. So if you remember when I talked about Git and what it is, I said we are storing not only our code, but our configuration, that is my runtime configuration, I'm storing that in Git as well. Not necessarily in the same Git repository, and actually one of the best practices in GitOps is to have separation of code and configuration in two different repositories, because they might, in fact, even though we have a DevOps team, 
we might in fact have different individuals. And sometimes there's a security reason for having different individuals in the different parts of the, uh, the code base or the configuration. But it's not only familiarity, but it's also the rich set of tools that have been built around Git. Tools that have been built into GitHub, remember that's the interface for operations, and GitLab that allow you to do things like tag things, allow you to set policies in there so that automation doesn't get triggered until you have the right number of approvals and so on. So these familiar tools and all of the, the bells and whistles that have been built around it are absolutely accelerants to frequent releases and shortening that lead time for change. Now there's another element which is important as well, and that is that these DevOps teams need to not have to file tickets. What we wanna do is we want them to be able to do self-service deployments, self-service corrections of errors, self-service observability. All of those things that I'm talking about are not self-service infrastructure, those are all self-service ops. Those are the tools that I need to be able to do operations. Now, in order to do self-service operations, we, but we need to do that in a very safe way. Kat, again, she talked about some of those, those instances. She talked about Equifax and some of the other breaches that were human error Although I would suggest, and Kat certainly did, that it wasn't the human that was at fault. It was the fact that we didn't put the right automation or the right guardrails and the right safeguards in place. Now, where do those safeguards often come from? Well, they come from the platform itself. So this is where I'm going to bring the platform team in and say that the platform team bears a very significant responsibility on providing a platform that allows the DevOps teams, the application DevOps teams, to do things rapidly, but to do things within um, some guardrails. So let's jump into that now. I'm going to start talking about the platform and what the platform does to support that DevOps agenda. Now, certainly we talked about automation and I hinted that there's a certain level of the certain type of automation that is really essential to GitOps. The automation that we did, uh, the automation that I'm talking about here is really kind of continuous delivery. It is this notion that when I make a code change and that code change has an automatic build that gets dropped into a image registry, or I make a change to my configuration, I don't want to have to do a clicky clicky interface to get that deployed into my dev staging and prod environments. And the typical way to do that is with a CD tool that performs that automation. But most CD tools, if you're not taking a GitOps approach, take an approach where there's a centralized CD environment and they push those changes out to those in, 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 into those runtime environments. And to that, I say, meh. We can do better. And the better is to turn around those arrows. Instead of having a centralized CD environment, making each one of the runtime environments responsible for their own continuous delivery. So you notice that instead of one CD, there's a CD for each of the runtime environments. And what we do then is we pull from those Git repositories into those runtime environments. This has a numerous benefits, but one of those benefits is certainly security. Because now, instead of that CD, that centralized CD system, which has keys to the kingdom, being an attack surface for hackers, we now, if we've compromised dev, that doesn't mean we've compromised production. So that is certainly one of the very valuable things. Now there's another element. If you notice the platform team, I said that they're responsible for security. And by the way, this is not the full security picture. I'm giving you just some examples of where Git, uh, GitOps in particular supports the security agenda. I also talked about their, their requirement to have guardrails around compliance, provide a platform that has compliance baked in. Here again, we're leveraging the familiar tool and the tooling that Git has is where compliance is something that's that we can we can benefit from Git. And what you see here is you see the log. So a big part of the compliance picture 
isn't only to minimize the chances that something bad can happen, but it's also to be able to go back and audit that in part to look for an opportunity to make improvements so that future um, breaches can be avoided. So what we have here is we have a log of every change that was made in that runtime environment in the Git system. Remember, even if it's an automation, that's gonna circle back and put commits in Git so that we have a complete log. So that's extremely valuable. And again, that addresses a couple of the things that, and these are things, a couple of the things that, that the platform team's responsible for. Now, those things are directly related to the ability for the DevOps team, the application team, to be able to do things very quickly, release to production very quickly, and very frequently. Now, moving on, you saw that the next thing that I called out for the platform team was resilience. And that's really where we start to get down into the blue characteristics, the things that are labeled here in blue. Again, measurable IT practices. I'm going to take them one at a time. Let's first focus on the time to restore a service and see how GitOps in particular supports that. Again, I'm going to start with Git. Not only does Git have a, a, an audit history, but I'm calling attention here to what all of you developers already know, and that is that every single one of those commits has a SHA. That SHA is calculated based on the contents of that commit the contents of what is in that repository. So versioning is baked in, and there is absolutely no way that we can go in and even change a file by one space and have the version, the baked in version, which is a SHA, not change. So that ability to go in and change a configuration and not be able to go back to what we had before is absolutely essential. We know that if version one, of course, it's a long SHA, worked in production, and we're starting from the same starting point, release re-releasing version one of that in the production environment will work. We have a great deal of confidence. Now, there's another element here, and that is Something very interesting about Git as compared to earlier source code control systems, and that is that earlier source code control systems tried to be very efficient in terms of space, and they only stored diffs. What Git does is it stores in each node in the version history, it stores a complete representation of the state of that version. That allows us to very, very quickly reconstitute something from one of those versions. We do not need to go and replay the log. We simply go back to a node in the version history and we say, let me take everything that's captured in this node in the version history and do a deployment. Now, I already hinted at one requirement, which is the next thing that I want to talk about. And that is the requirement of immutability or in fact, better said, anti-drift. It means that when I wanna reconstitute from a version in the version history, that I need to be able to start from a known state, a known base state. Now, this is where containers help and all of that stuff, but let me focus on where how Git, in, Git ops in particular, supports that agenda. And that is to keep us from drifting in the runtime environment. If I've drifted in the runtime environment, let's say somebody's done the modern day equivalent of SSHing into my Kubernetes environment, that is, they've run a kubectl apply at the command line and they've changed something. They've said, ah, actually, I'm going to change this configuration value for the application. As soon as they've done that, and I now try to revert from what I had stored in my Git repository, that configuration is no longer going to match what was running in production. So I have to be I have to be very careful that I'm not drifting from what's in production. Well, how does Git 
ops in particular help with that? Well, remember, we've got the application configuration stored in Git. And what we're doing is we're pulling. And we are constantly pulling. And so remember I emphasized the convergent system? Well, the convergent system says that I'm constantly reassessing, is there a difference between the desired state and the desired state now is not what is stored in Kubernetes because that was just changed with the kubectl apply. The desired state is stored in this version store that I've been going on and on about how valuable it is to the GitOps agenda. Um, it is comparing what is in Git to what's running in the runtime system. So it has this constant loop that's constantly doing that comparison. And if it detects a difference, it can do a range of different things. It can revert that. So that kubectl apply, poof, gone. Or if you want to have an environment you, where you want to allow that and maybe have a timer that says, actually, we'll send a notification and give somebody a chance to update Git because we don't want to revert it right away, you can do that. So there's a number of different things. Or you could just say, well, I'm just going to notify and we'll um, and we won't allow commits into Git until that mismatch is 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 resolved. So there's a whole host of things that you can do. But the whole point here is that we are doing remediation and drift det drift detection and remediation. All right, we're closing things out here. Let's now address that final measurable thing, which is the change failure rate. What we're talking about there is we are talking about reducing the chances that a change to my configuration can negatively impact my production environment. And there's two things that I want to talk about here. Number one, I can't help but go back to what we know and love about Git. Git allows a collaborative environment to have multiple sets of eyeballs looking at a configuration change, different perspectives before we approve that to go out into the production environment. No longer is an individual sitting at a command line and being the only person to click that deploy button. We have the built in, built into, remember, Git is the interface to operations. We have that built in to the Git system. So without question, multiple viewpoints and an approval cycle that involves that in a controlled approval cycle will reduce the change failure rate. But there's another element because I want to go back to this convergent system. And I hinted at this when I talked about GitOps at the very beginning. And that is when I do deploy out into the runtime environment, I've had all those eyeballs looking at it. We've approved the change. We now are going to say, we're going to go ahead and deploy version two into my Kubernetes environment instead of just replacing version one with version two we are gonna do something called progressive deployment. And here there's a special kind of um, automation that can support that. One example of that, which is a CNCF project out in the open source is um, Flagger. Flagger is under the Flux umbrella. Flux, by the way, is also the tech, one of the technologies that has this kind of convergent system that ties all the way back to Git. Flagger is under that umbrella. And what it does is it cooperates with ingress services and service meshes, such as app mesh, for example. It coordinates and cooperates with those to look at a set of metrics and start to carefully deploy out version two and slowly cut over traffic from version one to version two. If things start to look amiss, then it can automatically, without a human making the decision, revert back to the version one. And that is an integral part of the whole GitOps agenda. Remember, I've been emphasizing how convergence and convergent systems are a part of that. This is automation that supports that. So finally, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I will go ahead and do this build. You can see here that, again, there are a number of different GitOps practices and 
um, principles and technologies. I just talked about Flagger, which support each one of these measurable attributes that we that have been proven to provide value to high performing organizations. The final thing that I want to leave you with is I talked about continuous delivery. And what I want to say is that GitOps is not only, you might have noticed, not only about the continuous delivery part, but I also talked about these operational practices, things as they're running in production, and there being a feedback loop all the way back into the Git system. So I'd like you to think about GitOps as the combination of continuous delivery and continuous operations. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a wonderful day and evening. Thank you so much, Cornelia. That was fantastic. And what a way to wrap up our breakouts as uh, we kind of move on for the rest of our session. Um, I was just maybe if you've got a second, since they've still still got you here, if, you, if you've got sure. a minute to, to chat. Uh, so I just one thing that I guess would be curious to me, and, and maybe it's on topic, maybe it's not, but what do you think is the thing that when you look at uh, where we're at with DevOps or with the way we do software today, that really, uh, if you were to invent a time machine and go back to, to your younger self, that would just really surprise you and you would think you were just completely making stuff up? Um, I'm sorry, that would would surprise me. I, I didn't quite understand where you're going. Oh, with I was, that. Just, Say that I was again? Saying, uh, the, the, the hypothetical is you have a time machine, you can go back to yourself 20 years ago and tell yourself how we do something about how we do software today that would just make you think that you are completely full of it. There's no uh, way. You okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're getting you're getting to my gray hair is that I'm one of those people that actually lived in the previous era before we got good at doing software like we're talking about here today. Um, Mine is I think gray under the, the purple. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So I think the thing that I would tell you that would have shocked the heck out of me is the fact that um, a place like Amazon does on average a release every second of every day. It that that ability, I would have told you, wow, if we could release every six months. That would be pretty fantastic. Um, I never in a million years would have anticipated that we would have gotten to this point where um, we have both the software architectures and the DevOps practices and tooling and all of that stuff to be, allow us to do that. I think that that's, that's the thing that still in some ways blows my mind in spite of the fact that I've spent 10 years doing this. But it is totally tractable. Um, and that's what's so brilliant about it is that in retrospect, we're like, yeah, of course, this makes complete sense. But that was something I wouldn't have imagined 10 years ago or 20 years ago, actually. 10 years ago, we were starting to imagine it for sure. I remember we used to say that DevOps should be renamed Common Sense. And I said, but that wouldn't fit on my license plate. So thank you again, Cornelia. This was fantastic. I really, uh, we all appreciate it.